Hi, everybody. Oh, I'm not Michael Stropsky, but he is coming on. <laughs> it's Dear Jaberbo here. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to Let's Let's talk seniors, memory care issues, Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's, which every night we bring you information for seniors and families of seniors that could be most useful to you. As most of you know, I just started a senior home, uh, opened up in Shelton. We are taking tours and applications right now. Loving it. It's a boutique residence for six seniors with uh, assisted living needs or memory care needs, and it's a beautiful place. We'd love to show it to you. So tonight we have a special guest on because people often ask, how does one afford these beautiful places? You know, nursing homes, usually you can get Medicaid to pay, um, but what do you do with your parents that are living a long time now, into the, well into their 90s, 80s and 90s, and sometimes in 100 plus, uh, if you haven't prepared for long time care? So long-term care. So today's special guest we have is gonna be talking to us about long-term care and how to prepare. Michael Ostrovsky is here, and he has had two experiences on both sides. His family brought him into the insurance industry. His nan, aging in place and needing extended care, moved into his parents' house, then to a nursing facility. He'll tell you a little bit more about that. They had an impact on the family that had an impact on the family emotionally and on his nans financially. On the other side of his family, experience what can happen with probate, improper transfers, and not having a plan in place. He is here to tell you all about it. So Michael Ostrovsky, welcome. He is flagship, powered by American Senior Benefits. And thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. And thank we you very much for having me. All about senior benefits and long-term care and what the American seniors should be doing or if we should be doing it well before we're seniors. <laughs> Just give us a little bit about your background. Tell us something sure, about you. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, How you got um, into it? What were you doing before? Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, you know, I've kind of always, uh, you know, had of an entrepreneurial kind of uh, mindset, you know, my whole entire career ever since getting out of school, I was very fortunate to, uh, you know, have an opportunity to, uh, you know, begin a restaurant, which was uh, a great, great, great um, experience. Learned wow. so much about, uh, you know, the ups and downs of businesses. And, you know, that was something that, uh, you know, after about a four or five year period of time, um, I got out of that business. And then um, I started uh, doing selling cars, which I wasn't a huge fan of at the point. And, uh, you know, met some different clients that got me into the mortgage industry. And I really wasn't too happy with the, the mortgage industry per se. There's a lot of stuff that was going on, especially with the, uh, the corrections in 2008. And, uh, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, looking another pass. And uh, I started with an insurance company. And uh, it was pretty amazing because it really hit home to me. And it made a lot of sense as far as, you know, how we were helping families, individuals, and a lot of the problems that the potential uh, prospects and clients that I may be speaking to um, experience very similar problems and issues, you know, in, in my own family. So I had a kind of way to kind of, uh, you know, identify and have a good understanding of it. And, um, you know, I was worked for a very large uh, captive agency for the majority of my career. And uh, I left about two and a half years ago, and uh, we went independent and uh, partnered up with American Senior Benefits, which is just an amazing platform. And what it allows me to do is uh, focus more on the clients. And, you know, when I sit down with people, it's only about them. It's not about the company or the carrier that I represent because I represent everybody now. So it's really, really important that, you know, the advice that we give is, is really tailored to the individual, but we're also helping them shop when it comes to here's the potential solution. Now we're gonna look at all the potential companies and carriers. So, um, you know, flagship started around uh, two and a half years ago and uh, it's me and uh, about uh, 17 other partners that, um, you know, I have helping, you know, in the uh, communities locally here with families planning everything from Medicare, income planning, long-term care planning, as well as life insurance and estate planning on those sides. Really? I don't even know what Medicare income planning is. No, Medicare planning and income planning. Oh, okay. Medicare yeah. and income planning. Okay. So, so you do 
planning for all that? Or are you doing like more long-term care insurance and other insurances? And Yeah, uh, we use a lot of different type of long-term care insurances, depending on the scenario and uh, you know what's going on with the particular individual or couple that we're speaking to. Sometimes long-term care insurance is a really good play and a great way to generate income to pay for an assisted living or a home care or you know even a nursing home. Sometimes people aren't fortunate enough to be able to use insurance because you know you can have all the money in the world, but money doesn't purchase insurance. That type of insurance only health does. You know, so you need to be able to have the health in order to qualify for a lot of the plans that do in fact exist. So how does it work? So if you are thinking like when is a good age to start thinking about long-term care insurance? Uh, <laughs> as early as humanly possible. You know? Really? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, just on average, you know, every single year we kind of wait to plan. It's almost about an eight to nine percent compounding cost, not in our favor as far as how much it will end up costing when we decide to move forward. On top of that, the later we wait, the later we wait, we have a larger premium outlay and a smaller benefit. You know, so it's really, really important. The younger we are, we're going to be putting much more smaller contributions in and have a much larger benefit. So, so it's, it's really right. a timing issue to make sure that um, you can really maximize a lot of the contracts that exist. So it's like life insurance. It's based on actuarial statement. Most calendar. definitely. Yep. Most definitely. But it's a little bit different. So your life insurance, um, being a guy, I'm uh, I'm the enemy to most life insurance companies. So you know, if there's a a, a female my exact age, when we both look at insurance, it is a lot more expensive for me than it would be for her. You look pretty fit though, Michael. I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. It would actually just be, it would just be because I'm a man, you know, so guys, we tend to die sooner. We usually don't last as long and women really do have um, a lot more longevity. So in that scenario, life insurance is without a doubt more cost efficient for a female. But when then we look at traditional long-term care insurance for a female, it's much more expensive than it is a male to purchase. Ah, uh, because we live long. Absolutely. So, so give, me my, my what, give me an idea of what long-term care insurance covers for one. Sure, so there's a lot of different types of long-term care insurance, but when we look at your traditional tax qualified long-term care insurance, it's gonna be covering you at home for home care. It's also gonna allow you to use the benefit in an assisted living facility and even carry over to a nursing home, should that be um, you know, where you end up. And you know, about 50% of people that usually go on claim sometimes end up in a in a facility or assisted living. You know, most people always start at home. You know, that's kind of what I, you know, we've seen over the years. Nobody usually is, you know, gung-ho to go to a facility right off the bat. It's usually let's keep mom, let's keep dad home. Sure. And everybody kind of works around to find a way to to help and make it all work. So sure. So Michael, well, is there is there like um, is there a cap to it, to how much your yeah. life cap, or is it? Yeah. So you know, a while ago it used to be around four hundred dollars would be the cap of what you can start for a daily benefit. So traditional long term care insurance only pays out one way, and that's a daily benefit. And this is really important to understand. Um, we meet people sometimes who have a policy, and they call it, it's unlimited or it's a lifetime policy and they've got this 1.5 million or $2 million long-term care benefit. But the problem is it only pays out $200 a day. So in a scenario like that, right. going on claim with that type of contract for a lifetime period. And if you had considerable assets, you would be forced to co-insure the difference between the 200 and the cost of care today. In the state of Connecticut, it is by far one of the most expensive states to end up in a nursing home. Um, you know, from a daily cost, it's through the roof. Also, a lot of the companies have recently uh, pulled back their daily benefit amounts. So it used to be up to 400. The majority of them have cut it down to 300. So it's tough to even start at what the cost of care is today. And uh, when you look at these plans, um, there's ones out there that are called the partnership plans. I'm a partnership appointed agent as well. And that's a dollar for dollar asset protection plan 
uh, with the state of Connecticut and has reciprocity throughout the United States. And how a plan like that works is if your total benefit is 350,000 and you exhaust your coverage entirely, then the next $350,000 do not need to come from you. So you can essentially go on Medicaid and they're gonna back it dollar for dollar for every penny that you, every dollar that you exhausted, they're gonna match a dollar. So is that so, a special plan or is that just anybody? Very that special has plan. Yep, very special plan, absolutely. Very expensive, very special, you know? And, but the trick with those plans is the majority of them that I see, they're not really structured properly. They have too long of a benefit and don't have the daily amount. So we really like to structure plans um, short and fat. And what I mean by that is a short duration, maybe two to two and a half years and having a full daily benefit, one that's gonna cover the cost of care. And if it's, potent, if it's possible, have a compounding um, to keep up with the cost of care because care compounds and it's much more expensive as time goes on. So it's important if you do have a contract to have some form of ability to keep up with the, the cost of care in the future. Because what it is today, it's gonna to be much more expensive when we move forward. So Michael, after, let's say you do that and you do a four or $500 a day for the first two and a half years, what happens thereafter? After what, when they run out of the insurance? Two and a half, three years, if you've you know kind of front loaded it to cover everything for yep. four or 500 a day. So if they were still in the home and if they were in a, in a partnership plan, that plan would be picking up the next 250,000. Now, the majority of people do not have partnership plans. And to be honest with you, it's, it's very, very expensive. And worse, you start off with this very high premium and then you get these notifications a few years down the road that the insurance company is looking for a 60% price increase. 40% in price increase. Oh, wait, no, it, it's not like pay one price always, it's going to go up. It's always going to go up, you know. So, well, do you yeah. stop paying when you go into a home? Yes, there's a waiver of premium when you go into a home. So that's on traditional tax qualified long term care insurance. When you say and, tax qualified, you get a tax benefit for paying this? Yeah, so with tax qualified long term care insurance, it's not so much as a tax benefit, but it's more about how the benefits are used inside of the contract, you know, from a reimbursement standpoint. And there are certain ways that you could write off some of your long term care premium um, in some scenarios, all of it, but the majority of the time, a portion of it. And that's really based off of your age and how much premium that you're actually spending. So give me an idea of just somebody like a woman at age 60, for instance, coming right. to you. Is this like, I'm sure, I don't know if people are thinking about this when they're 30, but let's say, you know, 60. Nobody, nobody's thinking about when they're 30. And when they're 60, it's something nobody really wants to think about either. But it's it's right. such a reality, you know. And when you kind of think about, you know, risks and, oh, my God, am I going to need any type of care in the future? Um, people really, really kind of discount the probability of aging in place. The, pro the possibility of a married couple having one spouse still with the world at age 90 or, or even 95, you know, people are living longer and longer and longer. So when we have those types of risks that are known, it's important we transfer risk. And when you think about the simplicity of transferring risk, let's say you work your whole entire career and you know you get ready to retire you're 65 you're, you've always crossed your t's you dotted your i's you saved properly you know i've never overspent your mortgage is paid for and let's say you end up with a, a million dollars going into retirement um so since your home's paid for most people usually keep their homeowner's insurance because it's about transferring risk when you purchase a home in the beginning, the mortgagee is not going to even allow you to have a mortgage without the insurance being paid directly through the mortgage because it's about protecting of the house. God forbid something is happening. So when we then pay off their house, I've yet to meet somebody who says, I'm going to cancel my homeowner's insurance because I have the money saved and I already paid for my house. Sure. Nobody does that because it's about transferring risk. Right. And when you think about your car and you drive inside of your car, um, the probability of getting an accident is pretty big, you know, and it's actually against the law to drive without insurance. 
So most people, when it comes to driving a car, it's a no brainer that the car is actually going to be insured. And when you look and you think, I think it's, uh, you know, for homeowners with houses and fires, I think it might be five out of about 1200 homes will actually have a house fire, you know? And, you know, when you think about accidents, it's like 10 cars out of 1200 right around there. But when we look at needing some form of care or aging in place, it's almost about 950 out of 1200 people, seven out of 10 people after the age of 65 are going to need some form of, of help aging in place. And I think the biggest mistake that a, a lot of people think is they think long-term care means dementia. They think long-term care means Alzheimer's and it doesn't. It, it means waking up one day and needing help getting in and out of bed, needing help around the house, not being able to you know, prepare meals for yourself as well, or maybe going back and forth to the stores. It's really about that intermittent and that custodial care as we begin to age in place. And that is the big problem. Everyone always thinks it's you know an Alzheimer's or a dementia thing. It's really more of the fact of, is it possible that I live a long life? Mm -hmm. During that long life, if I okay. wake up in a day and I need help getting around the house, who is going to help me? And I don't meet too many people who say, I want my kid to take care of me. And I don't make, meet many children who say, well, you know, I'm working, but my goal is when my mom and dad need care to stop what I'm doing to care for them. But unfortunately, out of love and consequences, this happens all the time. Family members are, are forced to care for one another where it might be very challenging, you know, because when you do need care, it's happening to the other members of the family. They're the ones that are trying to find ways to get you into the right facility, have the right quality of care, make sure that the right money is there to pay for it all. And if the money's not there to pay for it, that's when family members are stepping in and they, you know, sadly enough, really start to become the caregivers. You know, I think the majority of caregivers that exist are actually family members. So Michael, give us an idea. Like if somebody comes to you at six years old, a female, yeah. um, what might you recommend to them? Let's say they are single okay. and have some assets. Okay. I know you're going to do a deeper dive than I'm saying, but I'm just making, you know, they have a house. Great question half a million to a million dollars worth of assets if they sold things what are you going to like just give us a simple example of what somebody might need and it. what it might cost and how does that cost escalate i am going to turn this here and hopefully you can see me and i'm, I'm going to find all right all right all right you see me you went somewhere, but you're good. All right. So if in that scenario, you know, what we would kind of like to do is, you know, don't kind of approach this as if, you know, you know, will I need care? I'm not sure if I'm going to need or not. Go into this as if you're going to need some form of care. So if you plan for it, it makes things much easier. And you really kind of have three different choices when it comes to finding a way to plan. All right. So when you look at maybe your, your original choice, all right, and let's say that person, like you're mentioning, they're coming and they want to figure it out and they're going to make contributions of around $8,000 a year, all right? For your traditional long-term care insurance, that's going to buy, you know, depending on the company and the carrier and the health, and this is very, very much an estimate, you know, like you said, um, you're not holding to these numbers exactly. So as like a couple, you would generate around $588,000 of long-term care benefits, all right? That is actually going to be paid out per spouse at around $8,000 a month for 36 months. Now, the other approach that you have or the ability that you can do to kind of take care of this kind of care, you can do something like self-insurance all right so now let's say you take that same eight thousand dollars and let's say for the next 20 years you invest it and you are fortunate enough to get a six percent average of a compounding return 
20 years later, you would have a pile of money of around $312,000. All right. The other approach, the other way that you can do this is this. Take that same $8,000. What's going to take place is we're actually going to use something called a hybrid life insurance contract. That 8000 is now going to generate a death benefit of 200 k for each spouse, approximately. And we're going to use a rider that's going to multiply the death benefit by 4%. And that's going to give you $8,000 a month for care. So the total benefit here between both spouses is 400 k And when you look at these three scenarios, I, I let everybody know. Well, let's take a look at what this would look like. If you go this route, by far, you're getting the largest day one long-term care benefit. No question that whatsoever. Now, with this approach here, your starting premium of $8,000 will not be your ending premium. The cost is in fact going to go up and it's gonna get a little bit more expensive over time. These companies all have what's called a long-term care worksheet that the client's forced to sign, letting them know the different price increases they've had in the past and how it's addressed and how it's taken care of. This plan here is a damned if you do, damned if you don't. And what I mean by that is if you own this, you're not going to want to cancel it, first of all, because if you need care at some point in the future, it's absolutely critical that it's there. And if you never use this plan, there's no way to recuperate all of that money that you put inside. There's no way that this benefit can translate to something for your family. The other side where we go ahead and we self-insure, well, the funny thing about this is, does that account exist, first of all? And it's very possible for you to do something like that. But here are our problems here. We have market fluctuation and we have taxes. All right. So taxes need to be paid out of the game. Here, the purpose of that long-term care insurance is we're not paying being taxed on the benefits that are coming out. And it's readily available for you day one. Here, we have a wait. You know, we got to wait 20 years of time. Hopefully by age 80, we've got this money but we have taxes that have to be solved, market fluctuation, there's all types of situations. Here, well, this is built on a life insurance chassis. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but there's actually a 100% chance that we're all going to die, all right? But when I say that, say it for a reason. I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> yep, it's, it's, I read in the paper a few weeks ago. It's, it's true. It must, it must be true. It is, it is, absolutely. So on this side here, we have a $200,000 death benefit on each spouse. This is only going to be funded for 20 years of time. Then it's going to be paid up. You're going to have the opportunity to use the cash value for living benefits or anything like that on those lines. But should you need care, you have that rider that's here that's multiplying the death benefit that's going to give you that opportunity. The downside with this is you're only going to get about 25 months out of it. You'll get around 36 months out of this style, and nobody really knows what's going to happen over here. So I kind of leave it up to a lot of the people that I sit down with, which one do you think is going to make the most sense? And everybody always says, well, I want to get rid of this because this is the thing of why I don't buy long-term care insurance because I hear of how expensive it is and how it gets more expensive over time. And based off of, you know, market fluctuation, of course, you can do great in the market, but timing is not on your side. You know, when it comes time for needing care, is that when we step into a 2008 or this year in March where we have this massive correction and then a lot of what you've saved is now gone. So most people tell me that they feel most comfortable going this route here. Yeah, I'm loving that route too. So, but can you explain it a little more? So. Let's say, so you, let's do the age 60 scenario. You have to pay into this for 20 years before it pays anything? Day one, it's there. Day one. There's day one, if you one die. Payment. I get day no. one, if you die, you get the death benefit. But or when, day one, if you need care, the long-term care is there for you also. You know, so right off the bat, if you took out a plan like this, that rider, you know, it's going to be set up where it's guaranteed. The contract itself, we usually like structure them where we have very good guarantees. So 
no matter what happens, we know it's not gonna lapse. And it's always gonna be there for the client. So here, you're gonna have day one coverage, but the downside is you'll only have 25 months versus the 36 months over here. But Michael, does your policy have to age for a while before you get coverage? No. Oh, so you're, not. Day so, you're, one. so you're not building up some sort of cash value on it first? You, you build up cash value as time goes on, but that does not dictate whether or not you have the opportunity to use the long-term care rider. So what and happens? It does not dictate your, your death benefit in the beginning either. So what happens with your cash value that you build up? All right, so over time here, something like this, if we did 20 years times eight, we'd have about $160,000 that went into it. Um, and, you know, and usually in these scenarios, the death benefit is no longer 200. At this point in time, it's like 245, 250, because it's starting to grow. So the cash value is going to be there above and beyond your death benefit, depending on how we structure it. All right. So there's a few different ways that this is going to get structured. We structure them in one way where the person is very motivated towards long-term care, and we don't worry about the death benefit as much, and we gear it all towards the care side. And in a scenario like that, they're, ever, they're really only gonna get back their money that they put into it. But when we base it off of the life insurance and have the long-term care rider, we have a larger death benefit that's there. And then that 4% multiplier is what's gonna dictate what you get each month. The benefit of doing it that way is you really do have a benefit that's there for you day one, right so, off the bat. Question, question, Michael, let's say you use up your 24 months or 25 months yep. and then did you use up your death benefit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Oh, so now, you have, now you also have no death benefit. Correct. Correct. So, oh, okay. so once you know, that's the, the, the part about this is when you look at long-term care planning, I don't think there's a perfect plan that exists. <laughs> I, you know, there's not a perfect plan, but there's a way that you can tailor things that will work for your individual but, needs. But I mean, it's so clever because honestly, I mean, a lot of people have uh, a life insurance policy, right? But they don't have a policy to take care of them for the last five or 10 years of their life. Correct. So are you just waiting for somebody to die to collect on a benefit? Nobody needs your money after you, I'm not saying nobody needs your money, but you need your money while you're alive. And it's hard to take care of somebody for years the family take care of them for years, waiting for some policy to repay them if that's what they're thinking. Most you know? definitely, most definitely, most definitely. And like only certain carriers and companies do that. You know, a lot of companies got involved with the traditional long-term care insurance and they treated it like every other insurance. So what that means is they went out and they did group plans of it. They went to these corporations and they allowed these large groups of people to purchase it with no medical underwriting. So when that took place, a lot of these group insurances and other insurances are actually um, written off a of lapse ratio. So the probability of somebody canceling at some point in time or when they leave that organization, the probability of them keeping it is usually very small. And long term care insurance just blew the actuaries away because when everybody left those companies, nobody canceled their insurances. Sure. They started having experiences with their parents. They had it in experiences with other people. So they said, we don't care. We're holding on to it regardless. Yeah. And then these companies actually got out of the long-term care game. They don't even offer them anymore. And these are very large companies that I'm talking about. Well, and you, they're done. I mean, it's such a great idea because the long-term care, you could be like, well, maybe if I don't need it, then I would have paid, you know, 8,000 a year, whatever, for 10 years, spent $100,000. And now with this, if you never need it, you just die, you know, well, fine. Then your family gets a nice big benefit. Exactly. Or let's if, say you wake up, you're 85 yeah. years young, you're healthy, life has changed, and the sun is in the future for you. You can go ahead and start borrowing against your policy and going on vacations, whatever it is that you'd like to do but it'll take away from the long-term care benefit, or it could potentially take away from the death benefit. You know, So we have actual ones that um, their brochures literally say things like live, quit, or die. Like no matter which way you approach it, this is gonna pay out. So, and so, so well, Mike, that, just to clarify, just to understand this. So the long-term care benefit, does it for your, for like a um, assisted living? 
does it build up if it's long the longer it's there or it just doesn't or this just a talking about traditional long-term care insurance no no well, high so high life insurance it will build up okay but when they're scheduled in the beginning they're always based off of what the death benefit is all right and as it builds over time it creates a very unique opportunity and the unique opportunity would be you may be able to use all 25 months of that and still have a death benefit left for your family. But that is not what we guarantee. What we guarantee is it's never going to go up in cost. You're going to be paying into it for a certain period of time. Then you will be done paying into it. Oh, that does before, not go up every month. That's the same price every year. Can never go up. Can never oh. go up. It actually comes with the same long-term care worksheet that this one does. And it states things like, our company has been doing this since 2012. Since 2012, we've never raised the cost. If we did raise the cost, it would never be greater than what's inside of the current contract right now because of the guarantee that's there. So it's so powerful. And as an agent, advocate, advisor, whatever you want to say, it makes me feel great because one of the most challenging things that I have to do in my career is every single year when these things start going up in cost, and I'm talking about the other long-term care ones, we're trying to find different ways to, to, to fund it and grab extra money. Or do we shorten the benefit? Do we do this? Do we do that? So I absolutely love this approach Wow. so much because you have options, you have choices, and it really, you know, you know that going into it, if you need care, you're always going to get the best benefit in traditional long-term care insurance. And I'm never going to say that that's not the case, but you will have increasing costs very, very soon. And you will have to pay for it as long as you're alive. And the potential of never needing it is very there. But I think in the big picture of like making mistakes, it's a little mistake to own a contract for 20 years and never need it versus the big mistake of having nothing there and then needing something at some point in time. So I love the fact of just getting rid of this idea today because of what we now have over here. And this really just gives people so much peace of mind that they're not wasting money. That if they need care in the future, they know they have something. If they don't, they know that there's living benefits inside of the contract also. And should they pass away, not a penny of this money was gone, and you're sending more money to the next generation because it's insurance. So it works out very well. It's a win-win. So Absolutely. The only downside is money pays for it. Health has to buy it. All right. Health has to buy it. So that's the, the biggest, biggest issue. You know? So and you have to buy this when you're healthy. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. It's just like car insurance. We can't crash into the car, into a pole, call up Geico and say, hey, I need insurance. By the way, I just had an accident. I want you to pay for it. So you're going to go through, you're going to do regular life insurance, go through our regular medical records. Like how does somebody call? One, great question. So the one with the, the rider, you do MCASs for anybody that's over the age of 65. So an MCAS is the Minnesota Cognitive Actuary Screen. It's a set of questions and words that are given to somebody. It's done over the phone. Uh, by a registered nurse, CNA, they have the ability to identify if there's any cognitive impairments and things like that on those lines. On top of that, an attending physician statement will be ordered from your um, doctor or physician with the notes, and you will be required to give a blood sample and a urine sample. Every company is a little bit different, but that would probably be the just or the most of everything that you would have to do. Under age 65, you don't have to do MCAS. Once you hit 65, you have to do that MCAS test. Prior, you don't. Under 65, you still have to give your medical records and your blood. Correct. Yeah. Yep. You still have to give your records under 65, but you don't have to do the, the MCAS. And sometimes medical, rec medical records are, you know, are tough because the notes that doctors put in there, if they recommended that you might need a surgery, but you didn't do it yet, all of those things will be you know, identified by the insurance company, and that could potentially hurt or help you depending on what was going on. So what if you wanted, you know, more than a quarter million? What if you wanted a half a million, a million? Of, of the insurance? So on the hybrid approach, under over the age of 65, you're capped at 750,000. 
The reason why you're capped at 750,000 is this. That's based off of the IRS per diem limit of long-term care benefits. Right now that's 360 or 380 a day. That number goes up every single year. So somebody that's 65 or over, they're gonna cap you at 750,000 because it's way too much money to multiply 4% by, and it's creating this massive benefit of which you may not be able to, to realize. So what they do is under the age of 65, you can go to 1.25 million or like 1.2 right around there. And the max you can have is 4% of that. And 65 and over, it's 750 is usually the cutoff for most companies. So when you say the maximum you could have is 4% of that. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so that's you, what generates the monthly plan. If you want more insurance, you could just buy a different policy that doesn't have not a hybrid policy, or you could buy absolutely a term yep. to add to it. So this is, this is basically to cover your long-term care. And so, but if you want more, then it pays to just get like term on top of that, for instance, right? Uh, I wouldn't really say term because the majority of the people that we're talking to, you know, it's not a term kind of approach. We don't know if we have a lease on life. So term works excellent when we're younger. We have to cover big debts, things like that on those lines. But when we start to um, age up there a little bit more, life insurance changes drastically every single year from a cost perspective. So when we have term, we're renting time. That's the only thing that we're doing. Once our time period is up or our lease is up, the landlord knocks on the door and says, hey, if you want to stay here, you got to pay 30 times the amount of what you're currently spending, or you have to reduce the benefit, or you have to do this. And you got to make all of these different changes and adjustments at that point in time. So, so term is really never the play that we use, um, especially when it comes to um, any type of asset protection, estate protection, you know, or making sure there's definitely something that's going to be guaranteed there for the next generation. And if we all had leases on life, I pick term every single day. It'd be the easiest thing in the world to do. Now, also, Michael, is this tax deductible? You're talking about tax something. No. So when we say life insurance, all right, so the government is the finest collection agency in the whole entire world. All right. So life insurance is a tax free benefit that gets paid out. Tax so whenever you have a benefit that pays out tax-free, there's no way that they're they're going to allow you to deduct the money that goes inside of it. You okay, know, they, you pay the taxes on it with your after you pay with your after-tax dollars. Correct. And the life insurance is tax-free. Absolutely. Tax-free. Mm -hmm. And are the benefits you get for long-term care insurance tax-free? They are. They do are. they go to you or they do they go to your caretaker or your sister? Excellent partner? question. Excellent question. So some of these companies, they have a choice of what's called indemnity or reimbursement. So indemnity is this. You qualify for care once. Your doctor writes a prescription essentially and says, all right, uh, Michael is going to need help with um, you know, activities of daily living for the rest of his life. He's going to need help getting in and out of bed and he's going to need help dressing and bathing and eating. And then the doctor writes that prescription per se. And that's, what's going to really qualify the event for an indemnity style plan on indemnity style plan. You never get as large of a benefit. It's a shorter benefit because you have all the control in the world with it. Reimbursement is always going to give you a larger long-term care benefit because everything's qualified. So every single time when you have um, your, your bills, all that stuff come in, they all get sent up to the insurance company and the insurance company reimburses the cost. You know, so identity, they're going to give you the money up front, meaning you're not going to have as much of a benefit and that reimbursement, you're having a larger benefit, but you don't have the control that you would with indemnity. So like an indemnity style one, it's possible that you qualify for it. And let's say a family member is, you know, um, a nurse or, you know, very good in that department. They can help out potentially giving some of that care, or administering that care or be the care coordinator per se, or maybe train another family member. Hey, when I'm not here, make sure you help mom with this, this, and this. Um, an indemnity plan is going to really help you have a little bit of control in that department, but reimbursement, absolutely not. You know, it's always the bills come in, they get paid.
So you're suggesting we do this before age 65, I take it. That would be the smartest, but the majority of people don't, you know, so. So most um, people are coming to you after 65? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those, you know, I'm hoping it's not going to be you and hopefully it's not me, but the facts is that it's actually one in three people need this type of care, but so many of us are just, you know, it's going to be my neighbor. It's going to be somebody else. It's not going to be me. I'm just going to die. I love that one. Or I'm just going to die. You know, that's absolutely, that's the easiest way to handle everything. <laughs> you, know, you know what I think it is? Like people are living so long now that 65, you don't feel old. There's, you're still working. Yeah. And it's just like you're you're not thinking like uh, 95. That seems 30 years away. So true. So, so true. it just seems so far away. It really so, is. And I think so much of retirement is is just you know it's it's your mentality. You know it's what you think of it. You know there's all these numbers that were structured from people decades and decades and decades ago, you know, like in social security, it was never social security in, in the beginning. It was more or less designed. What happens if somebody lives past the age of 62? What do we do? You know, well, let's find a way to start contributing into a plan where if people start living past that age, there'll be additional money that's there for them. They set the death benefit at 255 at that point in time in the early 1930s. They never gave an increase on the death benefit component. But as time went on, people started living longer and less people were contributing into Social Security. Population got larger, more people on Social Security, more people living longer. You know, it's really, really becoming a, a very, very tricky kind of, uh, you know, plan Social Security because of longevity and things like that on those lines. So nobody really anticipated that people would be living as long as they are. So it's really, really important for, you know, couples and family members to sit down and just say, let's plan that we can, that we live to age 100, plan for age 100. If you plan for a hundred, you're going to be set your whole entire retirement. Also, if you, if you plan for a hundred, you'll probably live to be a hundred. There's a very good chance. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I see that when people are still working or they have a, uh, they're not retiring from, they retire to, you know, so, so many people have this mentality of, Oh, well, I retired from this company. I retired from this company. Well, you retired from that company. What do you do? You know, and a lot of them now they're just, they're there. They're not doing much. They're just kind of sitting there. Then all of a sudden ailments come on or this happens, but like people who retire too, well, I'm going to retire because I'm spending all this time with my grandkids. I'm doing this with this and this. I'm going to start this club. I'm going to start joining this. I'm getting get involved with this. Those are the ones that are here much, much longer, you know, because they're actively you need a purpose. going. You need yep. a purpose. Um, Absolutely I, a purpose. I, I think that there's some kind of myths that we have in life that give people, the average American, let's say, a full sense of security, which is um, one of them is if you put away your 55 or 6,500 a year into your IRA, that's going to be enough. That doesn't quite cover anything, even if you just add it up. Like, oh, no. does that cover, is ever going to cover? The other thing is Social Security. Social Security also doesn't cover anything much. Um, so I think that that false sense of security that we have Social Security or, wow, I've been putting away my, you know, measly sum forever, that should do it. Nobody ever said that's not going to do it. That's just what's not tax deductible. You could put more, right? Tell so, me about it. So right? It is, it is. And let's say you have a couple that's going to get ready for a 20-year retirement. And let's just for, you know, math purposes, let's say this couple eats three times a day. And <laughs> each meal costs $10 a meal. Now, of course, when you're eating at home, you're going to control the cost a little bit more and stuff. But just for math purposes, so if we had two people and they have, you know, three meals a day, at $10 a day. And then if we multiply that by seven days a week, and then we multiply that by 52 weeks a year, and then we multiply that by 20 years of retirement, we're going to have a number around $480,000. All right. A lot That's of food. Eating food three times a day, a couple for 20 years, you know, yeah. that the, just to give you an idea of the cost of the scope of retirement, you know, it's expensive. And it gets more expensive as time goes on. And then when you add a care event on top of it, that's where we have an unintended invasion of a retirement income, our assets. And that's where, you know, people need to start making uh, different decisions and, and do different things. It, it gets very challenging.
so before actually before um, when I was starting my residential assisted living home, I actually wrote a book, uh, Senior Housing, and a workbook to go with it. And I started going to senior centers. When I say started, I started in March. So I went to one <laughs> and then kibosh, COVID. But I have a great workbook and it talks about exactly what you're talking about on how to, for people to plan their wishes first, their wishes for their, their burial, their wishes for their stuff. Where's, where is everything? Absolutely. Who's going to pay for it? How's it going to get paid for? you know, where's the deed to your house? Like, you know, just everything outlined. So it's not something you're doing when you're 90 and you, you know, don't want to have to put the energy into this information and nobody knows what's going to happen to you. So um, it's so great to plan ahead. I just have one last question for you. you. Kept talking about couples. Does this insurance, is it one insurance per couple? No, no, definitely not. The only reason why I did that before is because a lot of times, um, I'm sitting down with couples and sometimes that's just a scenario that I'm doing and I probably could have just broke it in half and made it a little okay. bit easier. But those are just numbers that I had stuck in my head. So each that's the only reason. Does, each person does really need their own insurance. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. But there are plans that are joint plans. You uh -huh. know, that is without a doubt. You know, um, we have one that's really, really, really unique. I, I mean, I love it. Um, it's more designed on the life insurance side. And it's a second to die contract, but it's so different than any other second to die that exists. Yeah. It's so, yo, it's absolutely amazing. The surrender charges in it are so small. The ability that um, where the cash grows and how it's structured is really optimized. But there's chronic illness riders for the survived spouse. So what that means, the survived spouse has the ability to access it for care. You know, that type of thing where we did before on that um illustration but it's just a different style when you have that multiplier you're using about 125 percent of the death benefit and when you you have an accelerated benefit rider you're accessing about 75 percent of the death benefit so so it's, so it's another hybrid plan it's another hybrid plan so you know a hybrid so you're not collecting on the first person that dies so if you're married you're not collecting on the first spouse that dies no. the nope. second one then has more care benefits, I suppose. Potentially, or both spouses are alive and we start accessing the living benefits inside of this. And what I mean by that is it's really designed to um, grow cash in a very, very unique model. You know, it's much, much different than, than, than the, the majority of contracts that I've seen. It's very, yeah. very exciting. So would that cost less than people it have does. individual? It does, you yeah. got that one correct, absolutely. So when we have a life insurer, and they're insuring one life, they only have one person that they know is going to die on that. So the first two years are the greatest risk to any insurance company. You know, if the person dies inside of the first two years, that is the greatest risk. But every year that they live past year two, the risk for the company goes down greatly, greatly. And when you look at a policy that's based off of two lives, this is the most powerful point. Um, I've had these contracts issued where maybe the husband wasn't as in great of health. I'm going to beat up the guys all the time because I'm a guy. So we die soon. Maybe their health is worse, whatever it is. So their health isn't as good, but the wife health is absolutely great or perfect. They're going to take the better health of the two spouses. And that's what it's based off of. I've had them issued where the one spouse is a you for uninsurable. But we were able to issue the contract because it's based off of both lives. So it's very, very unique on how it works. It's not a straight long term care plan. It's more on a, OK, we know we're going to pass. There's a possibility we're going to be here for a long time. We like the idea of leaving money to the kids. But if the survived spouse needs some form of care, at least we'll be able to access some of that money and still leave behind the benefit for the kids as well. That's you know, so that's my favorite so far. <laughs> a lot of people like it a lot. It's it's really, really interesting. It really is a great contract. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, there's only really one carrier that's doing it that way. But there there's a lot that are very similar to it that are out there. So, so it's a couple second to die hybrid policy. Yep. Second to die with an accelerated benefit rider on the survived spouse. You know, when we say hybrid, you know, we're always kind of looking at a multiplier based off of the death benefit. 
you know, so this one's a little bit different on how it works, but I absolutely love it. You know, I really think it gives um, couples the confidence that there's something there. Maybe they're not that, you know, passionate or concerned that they might need care at some point in the future. But the idea of having an extra pile of cash, whether they used it for policy loans or withdrawals or the survived spouse accessing the um, chronic illness rider as well. It really kind of gives a little bit of peace of mind for a lot of the couples that we speak to. So, Michael, you really know your stuff, I tell you, and that's good information. There's, I am learning just so much, seriously, and I know all our watchers are also learning because. Okay. And there's just there's one last thing I just wanted to mention for the ones that don't have health, it's not over. You know, um, we do two different types of things. If we're planning in the future, so we're looking for the future, there are asset-based annuities that we work with that are extremely unique, all right? Lifetime income annuities where once you're in the payout phase, if you needed care, they're gonna double whatever your income is for five years of time to help pay for the care. Then we have another one that's absolutely amazing. It's giving you about um, close to about 150% of your initial deposits that's gonna be there for care if you need, and that's gonna pay out annually also until it's exhausted. Really interesting contracts on how they work. So you're saying if you're sickly or have, you know- Less than perfect health. And the traditional is not gonna work, there's something else. Can you explain how an annuity actually works? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just in, all right. So uh, uh, annuities, basically the easiest way for me to say it, it's a reverse bet. Life insurance is the bet that you're going to die. Annuity is the bet that we're going to be here for a long time. All right. So what I mean by that, it's a contract between you and an insurance company. It's always usually structured as a lump sum. Sometimes it's done through contributions over maybe a 10 year period of time. But I I would have to say probably 99% are without a doubt a lump sum. What happened is money transfers over. Sometimes it's a rollover from an IRA or 401k or potentially cash that's maybe not working for you. Um, Then they provide different types of benefits. So depending on what's most important to you, there's an annuity out there that's designed exactly for you. Let me understand. So let me say you could take out a hundred thousand dollar annuity to make math simple. And that throws off like what percentage? So I'm going to give the company hundred thousand dollars in my cash. Yeah, I I I love your question, but um, it's that's just too 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 broad for me to answer. Oh, okay. know, there's so many different ways that they're structured. There's ones that are called MIGA, so that stands for multi-year guaranteed annuity. It's just like a CD, only it's ten times better. You don't have to pay taxes on it every single year. And when you go to a bank and you open up a CD. They don't take your money and keep it at the bank. They take your money and they give it to the organizations that I do business with directly, you know, and then it goes to them and they get a larger rate and then they essentially give you back what the bank is offering. Um, And what we do is we just go directly to those institutions and kind of bypass the bank and give it directly to the client. And it's usually done in the sense of a multi-year guaranteed annuity and tax deferred. So is this the basic? of an annuity. You're going to put up some lump sum, like a hundred thousand, let's call it. You're going to get back a return of something because you know, the, the institution was using your whole lump sum yeah. to make money and giving you a return. And do you get your initial principal lump sum back? All depends on how it's structured. Okay. So in that type of contract that I just mentioned, they're only for a two year, four year period of time, five year period of time and you have two choices. You either take the interest only every month as a paycheck, or you allow it to defer. At the end of the five years, all of your money, all of the interest that you've gained that was guaranteed is sitting right there for you. Um, the other type of annuities that I love so much more than that are indexed types of annuities. They don't give you a, that guaranteed rate of interest in the beginning, but what they do is give you protection. So what I mean by that is you have the ability to pick different indices um, or track something like the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, or BlackRock. But there's all these different ones that exist. And you track this indice, the insurance company takes all of your money and it goes into their general account. Well, 87.5% of your money goes to the insurance company's general account. 
has to be liquid to pay out benefits. And any insurance company, when they take money from you as an annuity, in order for them to take the money, they have to prove that they have one and a half times that amount in liquid reserves. Mm -hmm. A lot of the carriers that we work with have six to seven times the required reserves on the book. Like a bank to get out mortgages, right? Oh yeah, and when we go to our bank and we give a bank a dollar, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, that thing that everybody feels so great about, you know, this one little entity, all right, one dollar is given to the bank and they're required to keep a penny and a fraction of another cent in reserve. So 1.3, it's not even two cents is what's required to be in reserves. Really? Okay. Oh, absolutely. So, it's, it's so just the index annuity protection, you're giving money for a short amount of time, you're not taking your interest. Well, so where index was different than, than the MIGA. The index is usually longer for a five, seven, or a 10 year period of time. Usually better on a 10 year period of time because in any 10 years, you'd probably expect to have three years where you'd get a zero for interest, all right? And what that means is the markets went down. So when the markets go down, nothing can happen with the principal you started with or any of the interest that you've already earned in other years because it's protected and it's guaranteed. Then it has something called annual reset in it. So when we're in the market and let's say the market or let's say a fund was 200 and at the end of the year, it's worth 160. If you're in a fund, you're never going to make money again until you break 200. Inside of an annuity, there's annual reset. So at the end of the year, the annual reset kicks in. Then your year starts from 160. And let's say at the end of the year, it's only 180. The person who's in the market still hasn't made back money. The one that was inside of this type of contract now is participating in the growth between 160 and 180. And it could be a par rate of anywhere between 50 to 120, depending on the company, the strategy and the carrier and how it's selected. So it gives you multiple opportunities for growth with no risk whatsoever. I see that was a loaded question. What's an annuity? I love it. <laughs> I guess that's not so simple to explain. I guess there's tons of annuities. There's so many more. Yeah, I can I could be here for the next two hours. Tons of annuities. Well, Mike, you have a wealth of information. I don't want to keep you all night long, Thanks. but I really love the hybrid approach. When you told me about that before, I'm like, I have to have you come and tell everybody about that because I love it. I love the idea that you're not just having some big policy when somebody dies and trying to scramble and figure out what to do when they're 90 to 97 mm -hmm. um, years old and you know need care. So it's it's fantastic. It's just an amazing concept. And I think it's it's definitely needed. But I have one last question for you. Sure. Are you a New Yorker? No, Connecticut. <laughs> talk with my hands like crazy though. I know. <laughs> you talk the speed of I'm a New Yorker, but you talk at the speed of a New Yorker. <laughs> I know, I do. I know. I know. You know, New York, right reach you at flagship, which is powered by American Senior Benefits, and this is your best number, 203 447. It's actually my direct cell phone. So. Oh, right. Absolutely. So, if somebody wants to invite Michael for dinner, that's also the same number. You could reach him at 207 1606. Perfect. All right, Michael, thank you so much. Will you come on again and maybe explain some other things to us? I would love to. Absolutely. Okay, because this is great. And I hope it didn't go over anybody's head. Um, and if it did, just call Michael and he'll explain because there are so many things to learn, so many things to know. And, you know, you're a wealth of information, but there's so many things. And I'm sure yeah. you can do a deeper dive into people's personal situations and financial. Absolutely. To figure out what is really, really the best. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You got it. Glad it worked out. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, Mike. Right. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Anytime. Anytime. Wow, that was a lot of good information. I know I learned a lot and I love, do you love the hybrid approach? I loved it. That was amazing. I think that a lot of people have, um, well, a lot of my friends anyway, I know, you know, they've struggled with paying for, helping pay for their parents in their later years because their parents might've had enough money for five or six years. Uh, it goes so quickly if you need to go into a nursing home, even if you've sold a house worth six or seven hundred thousand dollars, it really doesn't last that long. And they've struggled to pay for their care. And everybody wants their parents to live forever, but um, you know, it does become a financial struggle.
Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Let's Talk Seniors, Memory Care Issues. I hope we're bringing you a lot of great information that you could use, you and your senior. So until next week, take care. Hi, dear to hear again. Thank you for joining me on Let's Talk Seniors, Memory Care Issues. Is this an issue hitting home? Do you have a parent or loved one with memory care issues who you feel is not safe at home anymore? Are isolation, falls, and safety issues becoming a big concern? Welcome to Dogwood Senior Home, premier boutique residential senior living specializing in memory care. It's country living at its best in the Huntington section of Shelton, Connecticut. We're truly a home with only six senior residents living as one family unit. Senior residential homes are concepts sweeping the nation with 47,000 across the U.S. We're pleased to open Dogwood Senior Home as it will be only number six for Connecticut. Brand new, sparkling clean, opening mid-June. And safe, 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 we are COVID free. Residential care homes boast a very low COVID infection rate across the nation. This is due to the intimacy of size and speed in which the caretakers can shift to accommodate immediate needs. They are much safer than the large homes and facilities, as you can imagine. It has been documented that residents have less falls and a better quality of life in a residential home environment. Our home is more affordable than the big box facility. You pay one all-inclusive price, and that price is guaranteed for the life of the resident with an incredible one to three caregiver ratio, which you won't find anywhere else. Our friendly, loving caregivers are dedicated and trained in Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson issues. We're only taking six residents, so the home will fill up fast. Call me at 203-689-7562 for a talk and tour. I would love to meet you and your loved one. See you soon. Bye.